we made arrangements. I sold my car. I quit my house cleaning jobs I was doing. I packed up my things from my small apartment I was in and um, flew to Kenya with my wedding dress, my wedding, all my wedding things, so, coming here to get married. Until one day she, she finally became broke, like um, she ran out of, like her bank account became, like it was reading zero. Mm-hmm. And uh, she really got so worried about that. <laughs> so the thing that I told her, I just laughed and I told her like, um, don't worry, welcome to Kenya. You have probably seen her photos splashed on social media, hawking foodstuffs on the streets of Kisumu County. They call her Mzungu Wamandazi. One day she was hawking and she was spotted selling the mandazis, the pretzels, like along the streets of Kisumu town. So someone spotted her, took a picture and uh, posted it on social media and it went viral. I had never encountered a hawker before. Um, so that was really new for me. And then of course, coming to Kisumu, it was even a step back from Nairobi. Uh, your wife, the one we used to call Mzungu Amandazi. Yes. The famous Mzungu Amandazi, you know. Yeah. Oh, okay. So she she, she, she came to one. be like the famous Mzungu Amandazi. So, um, yeah, babe, I just want to l- let you know that uh, I love you. Uh, you're the most uh, beautiful thing that ever happened in my life. There is none like you. And uh, I just love you from the bottom of my heart. I love you too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, babe. You're and this mission has been going for over 30 years. And there's never been a cross cultural relationship. Sure. Ours is the first. The first one. Mm. Oh my God. Here's a trophy. <laughs> Uh-huh. So my name is Sylvia Miller, and I've also taken my husband's name of Bichanga, and I grew up in the U.S., the USA, in a state called Ohio, where there's a lot of Amish communities, and I grew up in an Amish community. My name is Kelvin Bichanga. I was born and raised uh, here in Kisumu, and uh, this way I came to find my lovely wife while I was working at uh, a certain computer shop by the name New World Technologies. And uh, yeah, it was just a fine, fine, one of those fine days, uh, you know, waking up, going to work as usual, then, yeah. I grew up in an Amish community um, until I was 12 years old, is when my dad decided to leave, um, mostly because of some things in the church And because him and my mom were baptized into the church, um, their decision to leave meant that we were excommunicated and we were shunned, um, which basically means they they have nothing to do with us anymore. We are no longer alive according to them. So they don't eat with us. They don't um, talk to us. We are not invited to family events or holidays. Um, So we lived uh, quite a lonely life after leaving the Amish, but our family really became close because of not having extended family. Um, But yeah, I I don't regret my upbringing as Amish. It taught me how to dress modestly. Um, It taught me how to be a good wife. And and they have just a lot of good uh, morals that they teach you. one thing they don't um, encourage a lot is education. So most of us just go to eighth grade, which would be just before high school. Um, so most of us don't have any education above high school or even high school. Like for me, I only went to, I guess in Kenya it would be form four. Um, and mostly the reason for that is because Amish people have so many family-owned businesses that are handed down from generation to generation. And so rather than pursuing a lot of education, they would rather their kids leave school and go and work and make money. Um, Because also in the Amish culture, you marry at a young age. Most are legally married by 18, 21, somewhere there. So you find most men like to have their own house bought already by that age. 
So it's important you leave school as soon as possible and you start working. Yeah. Now, Flo, now, because we want us to understand how the Omish is seated in Kisumu and even have another name that's called Bichanga. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, the Omish, growing up Omish, if you know anything about Omish, they don't have electricity, they are not allowed to have cars, they have so many rules as to how you dress, how you wear your hair, everything like that, like no makeup, um, they don't allow cell phones, like just so many things like that. So they live very remotely. So we left the Amish and joined a group called Mennonite, which is basically a more liberal, um, less rules, but they still, still have a lot of Amish practices. Um, so you find that with the Mennonite group, they're really focused on mission work. So like for the Amish, they are not even allowed to board an aeroplane and fly. Mm. So they can't really do mission work because of that. But for the Mennonites, they're allowed to do that. So you find they do lots of mission work. So we were in the Mennonite church for around 10 years when um, we were called. My dad was uh, received a phone call from a mission from Kisumu uh, called AMA Missions. And they said that they do church planting around Kenya where they we, we, like they start churches and they need pastors to come in and preach. So they asked him if he would mind coming and donating his time to come and preach the gospel in Kenya. So we decided to do that. We paused our lives. His brother took over his business. His brother lived in our house, took care of the farm. He has um, over 100 acres like a big farm. So his brother took care of all that as well as his business. And we came to Kisumu, Kenya, and they have a mission here. They have around seven or eight churches in, in Kisumu and around the same number in Nakuru. There's another mission there. So that's how I came to Kenya. So when we landed in Nairobi, um, I was just shocked. And the only thing I could, um, related to was a state called Florida. In the US, it's, it's tropical, it has palm trees, it's warm year round. So that was my first impression. It's much like Florida. But then when I left the airport, it's when I, I realized this is not the, the US. I, you know, seeing a lot of people walking. Um, in the US, most people, they just drive. You don't see a lot of people walking unless they're stranded. So I was so surprised how many people are walking, like cows in the middle of the road. I had never seen cows. that. Yeah, sheep walking. And I had never seen a tuk-tuk. So I was so confused. They have three wheels and like it was such a new thing for me. Um, and even just people walking and selling things. I had never encountered a hawker before. Um, so that was really new for me. And then, of course, coming to Kisumu, it was even a step back from Nairobi. So the surprises just kept coming. And things like, um, because of me growing up Amish, I was very removed from the world, as, as to say, like mainstream America. You find my husband is telling me about Beyonce and Jay-Z and those people, because I don't know them. Like I. I was very sheltered, so he's telling me about my own celebrities back at home. Um, but it's just because of my growing up, it made Kenya even a greater shock. So even hearing something like a Muslim prayer call, I was scared the first time I had it. I, it sounded so scary to me. Like, just I can't even begin to say all the things that shocked me when I came here uh, to Kenya. But. Here I am, and I met this man. It was the first week. The first week. Oh, we were in Kisumu. Tell us about it. Mm -hmm. So because of my growing up once more, we, can, we would even leave the house unlocked, and we would leave for the weekend. It's in the countryside, and you know everyone. And so we didn't realize how important it is to lock our doors. So now we move to Kisumu Milimani. And um, there was one night we forgot to lock the back door. And we woke up to thieves in our house. 
they were carrying all our laptops, all our phones, any electronic they took. And my mom's purse, it's only my dad who woke up and opened the bedroom door and he saw the guy running past with our things and he sounded the alarm and they dropped my mom's pass on their way running and it had like her passport and ID and everything in it. So that's how I met him. He was not one of the thieves, but um, <laughs> one of the missionaries gave uh, my dad a laptop to replace the one that was stolen and it needed some repairs. So now that's where he came in. I, you know, just going to town was an adventure. So my dad, said, I'm going to town to fix this laptop. And I asked him, can I just go with you? Like, I just want to see things and see how the people are doing their things. And he was like, sure, I was always a daddy's girl. So I went with my dad. We went to the place the missionaries told us, we always take our electronics to this place called New World in Kisumu. Go there with your laptop. So me and my dad went there. We went upstairs where they fix laptops and there he was. Behind the co-worker, he was sitting there, as handsome as ever. <laughs> and it was just love at first sight, that's all I can say. I went weak in the knees and I was like, what's wrong with me? I'm trembling. And I was like, hey, this guy is the, hey, he's very handsome. <laughs> Where? And I'm that? here as a missionary. <laughs> Did you even say hi to each other? No, we didn't say anything. Uh -huh. Nothing. Just so he put right yeah. from where. <laughs> and I went home and I had a good friend at the mission compound and I told her, hey, I just saw the most handsome man I've ever seen. Like, if you need any laptop repair, I know where we are going to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just sitting there, then this beautiful girl, she was just walking behind her dad. And, uh, you know, our, our eyes locked and... Uh, it was like the way she said it was uh, love at first, first sight and ever since then we've uh, always <laughs> always uh, tried to communicate so that went on like that for a few months i recognized his face um i could be going in town maybe passing by with a picky um this was now several months down the line and i could just keep on seeing him and it was like whenever our eyes met it just, we locked in and there was just something there, but I didn't know his name. I didn't know anything, but by then I had come acquainted with the lady at the front desk that worked um, at his place. So I followed her on Instagram and I was like, they work together. He must be in her followers. Let me just see if I can find him. So I scrolled through her followers and I found him. And I, I actually had an iPhone I had wanted to sell at the time. So I was like, this is my chance. He's in IT, he fixes laptops and phones. Like, let me use this excuse. Um, so I slid in the DMs and was like, I have an iPhone to sell. If you know anyone who's interested in it, let me know. And I just wanted him to know if in case he's also feeling what I'm feeling, here's where you can find me. But I wanted to do it in a classy way. So... I just told him I have an iPhone to sell. Wait, you know, selling the left, the left. I was actually, okay. I was. Okay. So he just told me he doesn't um, know of anyone, but he'll let me know if he does. So I just left it at that. I was like, okay, he might be married. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know? And so I just left it at that. And then about a week later, he reached out and he was like, hey. And that's how we started talking in Instagram like that. And... Well, the, tell us when you saw that, hey, what happened? It's like, mm, <laughs> business is over and it's back. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And um, yeah, we then we just chatted. Hi, how's your day? What's your name? That's when we are learning each other's names. Um, I've seen you around town. Yes, I always see you when I'm passing with a motorbike. And so we just got acquainted like that. Um, so then, sadly, my grandma died about six months after we had arrived here. So we had to fly back for her funeral. So I just told him, and it was a little bit of a lie, Kidoko Kumban, that uh, I won't be in Instagram so much because of traveling. So this is my WhatsApp number. I just wanted to get out of Instagram because somehow Instagram is hard to message in more than WhatsApp. Uh, so I just gave him my WhatsApp number and that's how we started talking. I was back in Ohio when we first had our first FaceTime 
in my bedroom and all this time my family knows nothing i have to ask you wow well, the omish i you are in love well, okay so now i'm going back i'm at my omish grandma's funeral i'm sending him pictures and showing him the way the omish have their funerals and and then when we flew back i brought him my ohio like the state t-shirt each state has their color and t-shirt so ours is like bright red ohio state so i brought him a t-shirt and i think maybe a watch or something like that um and it was like i now wanted to go just from talking on instagram and whatsapp to i want to meet him so i told my parents that i'm going to go make my nails and so i just told him to meet me outside the nail salon so he also got an excuse to leave his workplace to his boss and we just met up briefly i was like here are a few gifts from home nice to meet you the first time we held hands it was just outside that nail salon so it was our first time spending time together like that so after that it was just a uh, a time of meeting up in town like that and then i went to a bible school in nakuru and it was during the time i was there my phone like all the students phones were taken you could only have your phone one hour of the day so i would always use that one hour to call him oh that one hour was like yeah so i was there for 10 days so during that 10 days one of the girls from there she's a kikuyu she is with the Mennonite church there and she just found out that I was talking to a man from Kisumu mm -hmm. so she told the pastors oh my God. Mm -hmm. and she was like this Mazungu she's talking to a Kenyan man and this mission has been going for over 30 years and there's never been a cross-cultural relationship. Sure. Ours is the first. The first one. Mm. Oh my God, you got a trophy. <laughs> uh -huh. So um, the next time their pastors came to visit our pastors in our compound, I just knew I was going to be attacked. So after the meeting was over, I quickly went home. But imagine that pastor came to my house, him and his wife, and they were like, just come and talk to us. So we sat outside and they were like, we've been hearing, like you're talking with a man from Kisumu. You know, when you work for this mission, it's not allowed. You're being a bad example for our youth. We don't need youth like you here doing these kinds of things. Are you going to tell your parents or should we tell them? So I told them, let me just talk to my parents. So that's how they left. I panicked before my parents returned because the meeting was still ongoing, I just went, deleted his number, deleted all the messages, and got rid of everything. Then when my parents came home, I just told them this is what happened. I'm talking to a guy in Kisumu. I have been for many months and I'm very sorry. I just delete his number. I deleted everything, I blocked him. Like, I'm leaving him, don't worry. I'm sorry for everything, I won't do it. And just to say something about, um, you know, she had already said it, when we were not uh, able to talk and uh, she even went silent on me. So they were very upset with me, but they were glad I had deleted his number and blocked him. And it went that way until Christmas. That was probably another two or three months, yeah? Yeah. So well, were you able, how were you able to hold in the three months? Who gave us that ex It was fear. Because I knew if I continue, I can be sent home. So then I don't know if I'll ever see him again. So I just wanted to lay low and see what happens. So that's what I did for those two or three months. I just pretended I never met him, but I was hurting a lot. I was missing him because I could always go into my, I had my own bedroom, so I would go into my closet and I would place a blanket up over my head and I would close my door and place a fan there on a high setting. Then I would call him and we would talk until even three in the morning. 
So we were so connected by that time because we had spent so much time talking. Yeah, so I really miss him during that time, but Christmas came around and it was festive season. But did you tell him that? What's no, happening? he had no idea. Oh, yeah. He honestly thought I went back home. Mm. Mm. And he thought maybe I was just playing with him somehow. So he got upset and also deleted my number. So it's now Christmas. My brother and I go to a swimming pool here in Kisumu. Mm. My brother is somewhere, he used to have a YouTube channel, he was shooting a video, so I was there alone. And um, I was sitting beside the pool, and there was these uh, Mazungu guys who kept on jumping across me, splashing in the water. And I just went away from the pool to go get my things. It's when I just see the back of this man with a red t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, that looks like my Ohio State t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Is that him? And just as I was debating, is it Corey? Mm -hmm. He turned around and looked at me. And I just put my hair like this. Back then, my hair used to be down here. Mm -hmm. I just put them like this to hide my face. I took my bags. I'm like, oh, my gosh. He's here. Mm -hmm. He's here at this pool. So I went to the other side and I was trying to calm myself down because for me, I didn't know, is he angry with me? Oh, is he like, what is he feeling? Mm -hmm. So then I just see him coming from below. There was a place to eat. Then coming up the steps to the pool, he kept on coming up beside the pool, looking around, but he's looking at me. Mm -hmm. He's acting as if he's just surveying everything, but he's looking at me. Mm -hmm. And I can just see him through my hair like this as I'm on my phone. Mm -hmm. I'm just watching him there. <laughs> he does it three times. Uh, comes up, surveying everything, goes back down. Comes up. Finally, I just did this to him. It's when I told him, just come. The reason as to why I was looking at her, it's because I didn't, like, all my life, ever since I came to know about her, she used to wear the plain dress, like the Amish, and uh, she used to cover her hair so most of the time the hair wasn't down you know so on this day she was uh just sitting beside uh the swimming pool and uh she was having a swimming costume and her hair was down i've never like in my whole life like i like i said seen her hair that long so that's that's why i kept on <laughs> looking confirming is she the one <laughs> it took me a while until when she finally called me and I was so surprised, you know, I was uh, actually happy to see her once more. So he came and he sat there. Then he's looking at me. Is it you? Is it you? <laughs> and I'm saying, what do you mean? Of course it's me. And he's like, what happened to you? And I said, my parents found out I had to block your number. And he was like, imagine I thought you went home. I didn't know that you were still around. And he's like, plus I didn't recognize you. I always see you when you have your Amish clothes on and today you're wearing a swimsuit and your hair down. So I was debating, is it you or someone who looks like you? That's why I was not coming to talk to you. So we talked there for a while and he ended up escorting me out to the gate and he's like, I really need your number. And I was like, oh, what do I do? Like I've just gone and disappointed my parents, sana, 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 and now someone I've really missed is asking again for my number. So of course I gave him my number. And again, we started talking like that for a few months, meeting up in town. I could go get groceries, but first I go meet him at the park, we sit and talk. Just like that's how we were surviving. Then um, because my dad is a preacher, he was preaching one Sunday and I was texting with him. Um, and he could just see from where he was preaching, I was on my phone texting. So after church, he just abruptly asked me, I hope you are not texting with that guy again. And I just lied to my dad. I was like, no, because I was also texting with a few other people. So I just told him I was texting with this, this person and this person, but I just, you find the way I was raised now, because of my heritage, I cannot lie. So I went, I told my friend, what do I do now? This is now round two. I've lied to my dad and she told me, you just have to tell him. 
I'll go with you, but you have to tell him. So she went with me, we sat down with my parents. It was round two again, I told them, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just let me tell him that I can't text with him. Like, just give me that opportunity so I don't go missing like I did last time. So that's what I did. I called him and I was like, my dad has caught me again. I'm going. We won't be talking oh anymore. Good. Round and two. I imagine round two. So that's how I blocked his, uh, I think I blocked his number or I, I think I deleted his number. I forget. Anyway, it didn't last long because they didn't take my phone. Mm -hmm. We again started talking. Mm -hmm. He'll just text me, I miss you, like, where are you? And we could just start talking like that, but again, and now that is when we became serious. You could find we were meeting three or four times a week. Sindio. Yeah, in the park, we could be talking and he, he could be telling me, I don't like that you're hiding it from your parents. Can we just, we're both adults, can we just stand up and say this is what we want? Because by then it had been a span of a few years, actually. Um, so I told him, Sawa, here's my dad's number. Call him. Tell him. I've, I've suffered a lot on, on my side. Call him. So he would tell me he'll call him. He'll call him, but then he wouldn't call him. Until I finally... Yeah, until finally he told me, he said, um, just tell your dad that this is what you want. After you tell him this is what you want, I will talk to him gladly. But I don't feel okay going on that grounds when you've only ever said, I'm sorry for texting him, I won't text him. So that's what I did. I told my dad, can we go out for supper? Can we have a meeting? Because I didn't want my mom to be there because um, she's a bit emotional. And like I said, I was close with my dad. So I just went out for supper with my dad, him and I alone. And he was so curious, what was this about? Because I kept on talking to them about, possibly I just want to go back home. Um, I want to leave the post early and go back home. Because in my mind, I had a feeling I will be shipped back when they find out. So I kept on bringing that idea up throughout the year, like maybe by end year, I'll go back home. Um, <clears throat> so he thought that's what I wanted to talk about, me going back home. But I just told him, I said, Dad, this is now round three. I'm still talking with this man. I don't know why, but there's something about him. I just can't let him go. And I told him I'm not here to cry and delete his number and apologize for loving him. I'm not sorry for loving him, but I'm sorry I hid it for so long. But I can't apologize. So I said, this is what I want. This is the path I want to follow. Can you at least allow me to date him? I get to know him better. So he told me because of my stand in the mission, that's very difficult for me, but I'm glad you told me how you feel about it. Let me discuss with mom. He discussed with mom. <clears throat> it was like someone died in our family. Like everyone was crying. Even my mom wouldn't give me a hug. Like, they were just so disappointed in me the way I did it. I hid it. But I didn't know what choice I had because of my position with the mission. So, we hid it as a family for a few days. I was still talking Mama, with him. The dad knew all, but you hid it. Uh, and even my brothers knew. And they were all upset with me. But I was not, um, I was not giving up my phone. Or anything I was still talking to him so it stayed that way for a while um, until my dad was like I just need to talk to the pastors here and we need to decide how we move ahead with this because I don't feel okay me knowing my daughter is in our bedroom talking to a man she's basically dating here and she's not supposed to be dating while working for the mission so when he told me I just want to talk to the pastors, I just told him, no, if you talk to them, I will be sent home. Mm -hmm. And I think ar around that time they had taken my phone for maybe a week or two. Mm -hmm. 
they took my phone and he was like, I just don't feel good you being back there in your room talking to him. Let me just have your phone. And I, I did tell him, like, my dad's taking my phone. I won't be online. And I was not allowed to leave the house during that time. I was kept indoors, cooking, cleaning on repeat. And I told him, there's no way for me to leave. Like, if this is the life I have here, let me go home and get a job. At least I'll have a life. And um, they went back and forth with it for a while. They just kept me hostage. And um, But the funny thing, every time I would go to town now with them, I would see him. Mm -hmm. Never fails. It happened like three or four times. I am going there with my three brothers as bodyguards, and he's just there walking <laughs> on the street. Mm -hmm. And we just pass each other like this, mm -hmm. not talking, not anything. Mm -hmm. And when we come to a crosswalk, he's crossing in front of the car. We could just it wave at no uh, They didn't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I could always <laughs> telling my family later, I saw him, I mm -hmm. saw him. Um, so that's how it kept on happening. And, and finally, my dad was telling me, hey, the way you, you keep on meeting him and I have your phone. At, at one point, he told me, I think I might start believing there's something about this relationship because you guys keep meeting even after I've taken your phone. So he started feeling that way. So then it was after that period that he was like, I feel like I just need to talk to the pastors. So another girl had been sent home for a very small thing just before that. Mm -hmm. So for me, I told him, you know, if you tell them, they'll send me home. So I told him, let me go home with a little bit of dignity left. Um, I just want to choose to go home myself. Just, I don't want to be a prisoner in the house anymore. Just tell them like, she has decided to go home. So that's how it happened. He told everyone, including the pastors back at home, that uh, she was dating a Kenyan man. We are shipping her back home because she can't leave him alone here. So that's how I went home. And my dad told me, go home and we'll be home in six months. If in a year you still love him, I'll look into it. So that's what I did. I went home and he told me, just don't be talking with him a lot, a lot, because they knew when I go home, they have no control over how much I talk to him. So he was telling me maybe once a week. Well, we tried, but we ended up talking Chanka. a lot. <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> we talked a lot during those six months. Actually, uh, three months after I got home, my three brothers also came back. They were having a hard time being here in Kenya. They came back home as well. Three months after them, my parents came back. Now I had been home six months. So after they were in the US for six months, it was now one year since I had seen Corey. Um, and my dad had told me, go home for a year. If you still love him, love him I'll you. look into it. And actually, the day I left Kenya, I forgot to say this part. The day I left Kenya, I asked my dad, you know, I'm telling all my friends goodbye, but I'm not telling the most important person so goodbye. Oh Can I just go and tell him goodbye? Because I don't know if I'll ever see him again. So it was like... Because of the mission, I can't give you my blessing to do that. Then I ask him, can you just release me as a 23-year-old to go and tell him goodbye? So he was like, it's okay, I'll release you, but I don't bless you. Mm -hmm. So I told him, I'm out. So I just ran with one of my friends. I found him at his workplace. And um, we ran up to Acacia, the rooftop place there with seats. And we sat down and I'm telling him tomorrow, in fact, tonight I'm flying to Nairobi, I'm leaving. I don't know when I'll see you again, but I'll have my phone. Just please wait for me, I'll wait for you. We were just having this conversation like, let's just be strong. He gave me one year. If in one year we still love each other, he'll look into it like, please just wait for me for one year. He was saying the same for me, like, please just wait for me for one year. I'll, I'll wait for you. And that's how we left. So. Fast forward now, one year later, we have been video calling to keep our relationship alive. And my mom and dad bought tickets for the three of us and we came to Kisumu for five weeks. Just to say again, the part where we finally decided to let her parents know about us talking, 
it was it wasn't so easy you know i had just to pick up my phone and uh texted her dad telling her if uh telling her dad if we can meet and talk it was hard but uh <laughs> I just had to gather courage to meet up with him. We had we had a nice conversation and uh finally um yeah, I just told him what we were doing and uh, yeah. but things went uh, well according to the conversation and uh it actually ended up um as praying like he prayed for for me and that was just one of the perfect thing that um i i felt from eh, from him on that day and um so you had a point where you met the dad yeah yourself personally oh my god yeah so i was i was, I was scared i was scared i was so nervous mm. but uh you know if if you need if you really need something in life you just have to let the nervousness and uh, the like you just gather all the courage to do to go for it so that's what i did i had to be me and uh, you know and i faced him we like i said we had a nice uh, conversation and yeah we got an airbnb he basically moved in to the airbnb and we did life together for 5 weeks we got to know his family we got to know his culture My dad had so many concerns about marriage that he will like be passed to the brother after he dies. Oh, How do I do dowry? Know. Like he just had because he lived in Kenya, he knew the culture and the different stories that happen. So he was so worried. I I can understand it. Yeah. Yeah, so my dad just had to make very sure that everything was going to be okay. I wasn't going to be handed to a brother for a wife after he dies or or how is dowry done like he just wanted to iron so many of those things out with his parents before he even allows us to date so he did that they found their peace they got to know him and um yeah that's how that's how they finally told us on our last week here you guys can officially date so me being from Amish background before I had come I had anticipated that they'll approve of him so I had hands on my own dress for that first date so I was so excited I got to wear my my dress in fact it's this one up here this was when they finally allowed us to go on our first date so we went officially hey, officially <laughs> so we went and did a photo shoot and Uh, we went to Acacia that night we had our first kiss and what eh yeah. imagine first kiss he was oh, yeah. <laughs> <Chan -ga. laughs> <laughs> you are a hero yeah. mm. so we had our first kiss we had some wine i remember we laughed that night like we felt like we had made it it's a win, it's a win. so then after that we went back uh, to the US and um i think it was around that that covid hit covid hit and there was at least a good 7 to 10 months that the airlines were not like things were closed i couldn't fly back but after the airlines reopened i flew back now by myself and i i lived in his parents mabati house here in mambuleo and um i stayed here for a good was it two months i think so around two months that i stayed here and during that time we got engaged uh we had went to a certain garden in nandi hills and he proposed to me and i said yes and yeah i flew back home and um prepared we were going to had we we were still planning to do the fiance visa during we had that applied time. when you were on the other side yeah We had, by then we had already applied for the fiance visa actually before we were officially engaged. I had applied before I flew back by myself. So we were going to do fiance visa and then because of covid back backlog the lady was like I don't know when this visa will go through now. So we waited for was it a year or two years? Close to a year. Close to a year. We waited for the two years, two years. Yeah. 
two years, right? Yeah. For the fiancé visa to go through, it just wasn't going through because they were so backlogged from COVID. Yeah, so actually during that time, my dad got COVID and he went to the hospital for two months. We almost lost him. He had to go on the ventilator for 21 days. He had to relearn how to walk. We really thought we lost him. So I, I saw that time what my mom went through with him when we thought he's going, like we lost him. Um, and I told, I asked myself, why are you staying away from the person you love when you don't know how long you have with them? Just to have what, life in America? So I just called him and I was like, why are we really doing this, waiting for this fiance visa to be together in America? See, we can just suffer together in Kenya, even if you don't have a good job, we'll just suffer together there, but we are together. Because I saw the way my mom was feeling when she almost lost dad. And um, just to waste years not being with a person you love, it really cut me to my heart. It's when we made the choice, we are going to move ahead with me moving to Kenya. My attorney was like, you understand that once you get married there, you now have to apply for a completely other visa. The fiancé visa will be void. So I told her, I know, but I miss this man. It's been two years, we're waiting, it's not going through. So I talked with my parents and they were like, if that's what she wished to do, let's do it. We made arrangements, I sold my car, I quit my house cleaning jobs I was doing, I packed up my things from my small apartment I was in and um, flew to Kenya with my wedding dress, my wedding, all my wedding things, coming here to get married. Wow. April, 24th of April, 2021, we got married and life was amazing. Life was just good because, uh, um, you know, after a long suffering, a long fight, we finally uh, came as one, whereby both of our parents were okay. Like uh, they had given us their blessing. That's the most important thing that uh, we really, really needed. So again, I moved in with his family and um, we planned for a wedding. We planned an outdoor wedding at uh, Resinga Island. Um, and actually, my dad was able to recover enough strength and gain enough strength, he came. My dad, my mom, my three brothers, and my older sister, and one of my nieces, they were all at my wedding. So we did our wedding finally at Rasinga Island and were married together with my family being there. My dad was still very weak, but my mom and dad walked me down the aisle. Um, all of that is on our YouTube channel, my wedding day. Um, but it was just an amazing, amazing journey. And um, three months after we were married, we got the call that uh, he should go for his interview mm -hmm. at the embassy for the fiancé visa. So we had to tell them we have already we already have a marriage license. So we reapplied for a spousal visa, and it's now again two years we've been waiting for the spousal visa, but. Here, yeah, that's where we are today. We are now here together, that's married. <laughs> it's a long oh story. God, it's, it's... So after we got married, uh, we started, started uh, living as husband and wife. Like I said, life was uh, okay, good. After the all the struggles. Uh, at that time, I used to have a small shop that I used to run. I had left working for new world yeah. so i started my own shop and uh at that time my wife was just uh, at home as a housewife so it uh it happened like uh we stayed for quite some time and uh funny enough we became broke in that uh, you know for her she had sold everything like uh, her car back in the u.s to come and stay with me mm -hmm. and uh we spent you know most of the time uh, together. So my my work, work that I was doing, it wasn't generating enough income to sustain us. So we didn't even know that uh, we were spending most money from her side. 
until one day she, she finally became broke like um, she ran out of like her bank account became like it was reading zero mm-hmm. and uh, she really got so worried about that <laughs> so the thing that i told her i just laughed and i told her like um, don't worry welcome to kenya because uh, in africa uh kenya to be specific we always live day in day by day so finally when she became broke we like i said i was uh working on this other shop so again the shop didn't do so well so i decided to try another job so at that time she also started like uh selling the pretzels the we for our people here they call it a uh, mandazi so she started that business with a friend uh just uh, an american friend which right now they are in the united states so um yeah mzungu pretzels sorry mzungu pretzels shop mm. so that is where they used to sell uh the pretzels and uh other even chai and uh, people really love the chai so the before tea. you go far your wife the one who used to call mzungu amandazi yes the famous mzungu amandazi you know yeah so well uh they was doing that business with a, a, a friend so one day she was hawking and she was spotted selling the mandazis the pretzels like along the streets of Kisumu town so someone spotted her took a picture and uh, posted it on social media and it went viral so uh, that's when she was being called mzungu wandazi yeah and you find that the lady was working for with my wife had left because of the the idea that it was in the newspaper and she didn't want it to be uh featured, featured because uh, most of the time the newspapers they were coming the media people they were coming wanting to do videos and she didn't like so uh she quitted and uh, at that point i had to chip in to to help with the business so we did that business for quite some time and uh, you find that um, when we got married a few months later we opened our youtube channel just to sh- show her people on the other side the life that we are having here in, here here in Africa that was our main reason mm-hmm. why we opened the youtube we didn't even know that youtube pays mm-hmm. so our aim was to sh- share our life story with her friends because we couldn't just be doing videos sending to in each bus on so you know you know it was going to be so hectic mm-hmm. so um yes i started helping her and uh we didn't know that it was illegal for her to work because uh oh. selling the mandazi she was working so uh we had applied for dependency pass for her to stay longer in Kenya and uh you know for dependency pass it means that you depend on a Kenyan okay. you're not supposed to work if you want to work you have to pay 100,000 for the work permit which is uh, right now it has gone to even 250 <laughs> <laughs> with the tax and everything so so um when we went to apply for the dependency pass at uh, the government office so she they they saw her and the mm-hmm. at, at at that moment they say that what are you doing like you are not supposed to be working without the work permit mm-hmm. so they we had like a, a hard decision to make so we had just to close down the shop mm-hmm. and uh, she could be selling uh the the pretzels like uh the mandazi it make them at home and and uh hawk them in town oh. so at that point we took a loan from my dad in law uh to buy the car that we are having right now so that i could do uh uber like a uh, taxi and that is what it actually uh helped to you know with the income to sustain us and also because for even for her it was so hard for her to go out and coming back uh because of uh they just by doing that the government didn't like about her going to hawk the mandazi so it was uh hectic it was so hard until at one point we just decided to close down the shop they i mean not the business even for hawking in the streets of kisumu 
So we, I was only the one working, trying to get income from uh, no, the yeah, Uber, Uber the taxi. Yeah. But yeah, so it uh, actually helped a lot till uh, there's this this point when, but we, we kept on doing more videos okay. to post. Then uh, after six months, we were monetized. Then uh, after three months, we got our first payment, which was about um, 8,000. Kenya shillings. Yeah, Kenya shillings. After they had taken their 30%. Mm -hmm. You know, YouTube always takes uh, 30%. Yeah. Again, uh, the next payment came after two months, the other one after four months. So it wasn't uh, enough pay payment that could sustain us. We could depend on. And that time we were living at... Uh, the house that we were living, we were paying around um, 13,000 Kenya shillings, which is about uh, 100 or even $95. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, so that was uh, the hassle. The hassle. Yeah, so I, because of my story, I can just say I would like to encourage anyone who is in a cross cultural relationship or a long distance relationship to keep your communication there keep struggling, keep striving, and um, you can also have the impossible become possible uh, if you have commitment and trust between each other. Those are the most important things. If you trust your partner and you have that commitment of, of waiting for each other, whether it's to one of you to move or whatever life brings your way, but so long as you just stay committed, yes. And if you would like to see more about our cross-cultural love and our story, you can find us on YouTube at uh, Sylvia and Quarry Bichanga. We share our love story there, our wedding, and now just our daily life as we look forward to his visa going through and him having his first trip to America. Um, we have so many things to share with you guys, so make sure to go and subscribe to that. And you can also find me on Instagram Sylvia underscore Bichanga. Yeah, so um, our like uh, as we wait for our spousal visa, which we did, we don't even know when it will come back. So the point we are where we are waiting is just for the uh, the interview date. So as we wait for that, we've been doing like different activities, and uh, we are planning to buy a land here in Kenya and build our f future, like our dream home. That's something that we've always been dreaming about it. And we found the land just close to where we live. It's on a harper hill. And it has an amazing view of Kisumu City. And you already found the land? Yeah, but now the finals, it's very expensive. We are still trying to raise that money. They talked about 5 million. So we are still trying to get uh, the 5 million to That's get- thousand cash in US dollars. Yeah, that is uh, around 50,000 USD. Tell people here to, to get to, to, to go like doing <laughs> that vision, then we will come as the best in that house. Yeah, so that is just our 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 dream our, and our prayer to finally get that piece of land. And because we want to start our journey of building our dream house, do more videos on that. So that is the only thing that uh, we are we are trying. We've tried to talk to the bank to get as loan. They're not uh, able to do that. Like uh, we've tried so many areas. So. We just hope that one day we'll be able to get that dream, dreamland and uh, build our dream home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we plan to stay, like our life, we are planning to stay in Kenya longer than in the U.S. In the U.S., we'll be just going for a visit, then we come back. That is just our uh, vision. The vision. So uh, we have uh, our own YouTube channel, uh, Sylvia and Corey Bichanga. That is where you can always uh, find our love stories, our lifestyle, like every, all the, our vlogs, every, our daily life, we always post uh, on that uh, channel, mm -hmm. Sylvia and Corey Bichanga. And uh, I'm always on Instagram, uh, Corey Bichanga. Mm, yeah. God bless you, Bichanga. You no, also I have a YouTube channel. Yeah, and, and guys, I have a personal YouTube account where I show people uh you know at times you cannot record everything in our main channel so i do try to i do, I do I, because i do traveling videos i try to also share my life with my audience so my channel has thirteen thousand 
subscribers mm. 13000 subscribers i do help even the grannies to uh rebuild renovate their houses and i've already helped uh two grandmas mm. yeah and uh even there's a a girl that uh, we are taking to school so that channel is uh helping uh the grandmas and uh, the school girl to school so the name of the channel is uh, kore the traveler Kore the Traveler. Oh, yes. I did not know about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> last and one last word mm -hmm. that I can tell um, my audience, our people who are watching this from just our story, just one word mm. or just one sentence, quitting is not an option. Yeah. Thank you very much. We are not quitting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Thank you. Uh, yeah.